So today what we're going to look at is we're going to talk about Donna. And the thing about Donna is that it is an integral part that has been sort of put on the side. Um, and I'll tell you what I mean. Um, it's, it's one of the slippages that I mark as a slippage because there were two sets of threes that we were supposed to be concerned with when we're starting to look at learning about the teaching. And the two sets of threes were Donna Sila Bhavana. And the second one was uh, Sila Samadhi Panya. Okay, and Donna was generosity. And Donna is an integral part of the Sila morality because the the thing that the the reason it's important you don't skip the first three and actually i will tell you a story because i didn't know that it was so odd because i was taught from the beginning that donna sheila bhavana is the first thing you have to put together but then a man called me from canada on the phone and said what are you teaching Everyone else is teaching Sila Samadhi Panya. Why are you teaching Donna Sila Bhavana? And then I had to learn what this was in the beginning and go back and figure out because I'm always interested in if you're practicing a meditation, why aren't you progressing? Why isn't it moving along? It's not just that it's different from the way we're teaching the meditation. There's more to it than that. One of the things that we're doing is returning to a system where we're teaching a parallel teaching of Buddhism. We are making an effort to teach you comprehension of the Dhamma and a meditation training side by side like this so that they're parallel and they're happening at the same time. And if you are, if apparently what we figured out over about 10 years or so, I could see very clearly that if people were coming in who had had a lot of meditation or sat for long periods of time and such as that, they were not progressing and they were coming to find out what we were doing and then the difference as I was working with them, I would find out was they didn't have a comprehension that was aligned with meditation. So what do I mean by that? I mean, basically speaking that you can learn a lot about Buddhism from books and stuff, but if they keep teaching it all over the place, if you keep studying it in just pieces scattered all over, you never get the full picture of this tapestry. And the very old teachers I met in Sri Lanka were in their 90s and they were telling me, yes, it's true. They used to talk about a Dhamma cloth. What was this Dhamma cloth, I would say? I said, this Dhamma cloth is the connecting together of all the threads, the suttas, they would say. And the connecting together of that was the teaching. And it was the whole Dhamma cloth that we wanted people to learn. Da, what uh, Bhante did with the teaching, he shrank it down to this perfect uh, setup of the six pieces and two supporting parts. So there's eight pieces to it in the retreat. So you have instructions first and precepts. And that's what's in the first segment. The second night is hindrances and the comprehension of how they work. The third night is path education. The fourth night is review and retuning of your understanding of Satipatthana Sutta. And after that, looking at dependent origination in a very practical way so that you can apply it and use it in daily life. And the next day is anatta teaching. The anatta teaching is really, really important, okay? Because it's telling you how you will eventually figure this out. How do did I invent I? 
me, my, mine. How did that happen? And so this is a fascinating thing about that. Recently, I listened to um, Bhante Punaji and he had, he had targeted this very well because he turned it into one of our problems, the reason we don't progress. You, you know how in your practicing tranquil wisdom insight meditation, we tell you, you have to let go. What do we have to do? Let go. What do we have to do? Get out of the way and let go and leave everything behind and just try to see experience and experience of nothing is there. And that's where you are. I'll tell you why during this thing when I'm talking to you about this, but it all goes back to setting the stage in the beginning before we teach you those pieces in order for you to receive the information internally and externally and start using it in life right away. And this is why the Dana Sila Bhavana, if you skip that teaching and you go to Sila Samadhi Panya, you have not given the Sila Samadhi Panya what it needs to actually function the way the Buddha wanted it to work. So, when I look at a Sunday school program today, dana in some Sunday school programs of very large concerns in Buddhism tell the child at four or five years old, dana is very important. Dana is generosity, they say. Bring food to the monks. That's all I say. <laughs> And I'm amused by it because, wait a second, wait a second, this is my little child and I want them to understand the core basis of Buddhism and why generosity is important. And you're telling him only that and I'm flipping the pages looking for the other part. It's not there anymore in the new version of the Sunday school program that took five, five years to, uh, to put together. I was really surprised. So I want my little girl or little boy to understand from the beginning that generosity is generosity of thoughts, words, and deeds. In the home, on the street, at school, everywhere, with everything. That's what I want them to understand. If we're talking measurement of merit and stuff like that, you want to say still bringing the meal to the monk at the temple is the highest merit. You can say that is fine, but let's teach them the basics of it first before we tell them that. Because what is supposed to be doing for those children is making them feel really good inside they gave that to someone. So giving it to the beggar on the street or the person who's so old, there's no place for them to live and they go in groups and stay near some of the temples in this area and they have no one to take food to help them have enough food. That's a big deal. And you can feel really good about helping people to have food and have just the basic necessities. So Donna is an in integral part. It's not a separate part. It's an integral part of Sila, which is the morality. At Damasuka, you know, we're talked about the importance of Donna because Bhante basically agrees with this is a vital part for any serious student in meditation that the idea of practicing pure generosity before approaching actual meditation training, it isn't a new idea. Because why? We just don't hear about it so much these days. And the very old monks, as I told you, in Sri Lanka, the first thing that was recommended to them before they received instruction from their teachers had to do with forgiveness and with uh, dana. It's unfortunate that in the West, uh, the request for to practice dana is often replaced with the explanation in a center, like a Buddhist center or a meditation center. There's always a very small, very artful, beautifully framed sign that says in Buddhism is a traditional to give financial support for the continuation of the teaching of the Dhamma and the maintenance of the Buddhist centers for the benefit of all beings. That's what it says. 
And that's all it says. It doesn't give any lesson on done. It. That's all it says. You know, and I, I wanted to find something else in this one center I was at. I couldn't find anything else. That's it. Okay, that's what it's reduced to, but that's not enough. It just doesn't let you know what the generosity practice was for in the beginning, and how it was connected with your training. It's a preparatory step for opening your heart. It's a softening of your heart. How do you feel when you give something to someone? This is what you ask yourself. How do you feel when you give something to somebody? That's what's happening to the person. And for some people who have been through hell and back again in their life, they haven't been feeling anything for a very long time. Learning how to do basic things in Donna, face to face with people, can really, really, truly, truly change their life. It really can. And so it's an important thing to understand. It's really touching your heart. A meditator learns it's good to build up loving kindness meditation so they can begin to change their behavior patterns and gain more peace of mind. We point out now to you more specifically what you're doing when you're practicing the way that we're teaching you is that you are purifying your mind by doing right effort and right striving the right way. And you are retraining your mind. And to retrain your mind or reprogramming your mind so that it doesn't always react. Instead, it starts to learn how to respond. So TWIM follows universal laws and it naturally helps us to shift in the direction uh, that could lead the world to peace. This is to world peace, because what's needed is to get back in touch with the basic natural things. And we're way far away from that right now. One cannot offer generosity to others until we have sincerely experienced it ourselves too. That's a difficult thing. There is a natural law in physics that you must have something within you before you can share it with others. And this is about natural balance and the natural way, natural order of things. So there are three kinds of generosity. There's a generosity of thoughts in your mind, a generosity of verbal speech, and a generosity of physical actions that are tied together. And we, we look at how we've been talking about uh, some of the other pieces of everything. We say, well, if a person, I, you change your intention, your mind, your brain, you set up an intention, intention leads to a decision and the decision to action and the action to consequences and good karma. That's how it works. Why are these important? It's kind of like a car before you take a trip, your car must be full of the needed fluids and have proper air in the tires and a well-tuned engine with good timing. And the meditation is similar. For the meditator to progress easily, your heart must be opened and your mind softened without any hard-heartedness due to any past grudges. We need to begin with courage, firmness, confidence, and giving gifts to others helps us to grow these needed states of mind. They all have effects on us. At first, you will feel challenged to stop thinking about personal things. And it might be the first time in your life that you're asked to let go of your thoughts. In today's society, we are extremely competitive. You may have noticed that part. And many of us have become a victim in some way or other. So the meditation is an attempt to lift yourself out of that kind of routine and take a role of an ex explorer for a time. Investigating how life actually works offers a different viewpoint from which we can see our life situation. In essence, this is the first step of practicing Renunciation, too, because you're giving up something. As you briefly let go of prior living patterns and you think of others around you sometimes for the first time in your life, this is your first exposure 
to the concept of renunciation. This practice of renunciation on any level lets one see what happens when they decide to choose a more impersonal, positive translation of a situation as it's happening, instead of giving in to negative personal thinking centered around themselves and based on the past. So most of us are all too ready to judge a situation without considering real information. And it's so easy to judge something without all the facts. It is, isn't it? You know, people, they do this all the time. Our newspapers, for instance, they feed us this inaccurate information. They tell us it's the truth. But is it, is this really okay? What if the material we're reading or seeing isn't the truth of what's going on in the world? Practicing the removal of our personal judgment is one way to see more clearly the truth about how we humans actually work. We want to approach our investigation as non-judgmental explorers who are pursuing skills in our meditation training that will allow us to see what is essential and what is unessential in any situation in life. It's a game. That's why I like it. <laughs> My family was raised with board games. And in the summertime, we were at the seashore at my grandmother's old house, you know. If the Northeaster came and we couldn't go to the beach and play, we were stuck in the house a few days with rain and thunder and lightning and everything and lots of wind. We were practicing inside. Uh, that's a game, you know, we were, the games would occupy us. And that's one of the reasons I guess I like all this because a lot of this can be figured out in terms of getting you to play a game to realize part of what the teaching is. So while practicing generation, generosity of mind, our perspective is likely to shift away from taking things too seriously. And we begin to consider how the same situation might look very different through more neutral, kindly eyes. We begin to pause after an event happens and check out what it feels like without a personal opinion involved. If we reflect on it and relive it or write it down how it, how it happened with us and write it down again, without a personal in view involved. For a moment, we realize I, me, my, and mine fell into the shadows and the clouds opened, the sun shone bright, and we glimpsed a particular truth about life that we had not considered before. And that's how we learn how change can happen in our life and change, make a decision to change how we're doing things. How can I practice generosity through speech? This is Q asking. Have you ever been in a situation where people around you were being unfairly critical towards a person who is not there to defend themselves? That's gossip in the office, for instance. Or maybe you've witnessed judging someone openly, but without all the facts in front of everyone. Would you dare to suggest to the group that gathering in all the information before coming to a conclusion might be a good idea? Are you willing to do that? Would you stand up for a person being criticized when you knew what was said was not true, but you weren't sure about the truth? Would you help? This would be stepping away from personal concern for yourself and doing what needs to be done for another human being, you could privately bring up alternatives from the wrong view that was going around with everybody else, couldn't you? None of this would be impossible. This is one way to practice generosity of speech. Another way is complimenting someone in an office setting, telling them they're doing a good job. 
let them know that they look happy or they're dressed nicely or they bring sunshine into the office and just letting people know that you appreciate them is something that we can do openly rather than assuming that they don't need to hear any validation. You know, it appears to me that all the conflicts in the world occur when one person, one side takes action based on assumptions without having information. And this often leads to war. Giving out positive vibrations through speech is not costly and helps to change home and work environments to be more friendly and productive and supportive, feel supportive. Leaving speech out of the equation can lower morale and cut production. It's because the, the stuff that's rotten is like leaving the apple in the barrel. It's gonna rot all the other apples. It's nothing is gonna be edible. So these are a couple of things we need to try out for ourselves is the question. Yes, when practicing TWIM, we need to feel the openness of our heart as we perform generosity. Discover what it feels like to say what you mean and do what you say. Take note of how it feels when you say it. This is the beginning of opening your heart, enlightening your mind, and you can feel the difference. What about physical deeds? Well, practicing generosity through physical action has many shapes. And most of the time it involves putting yourself and your time aside for others. You can plan a generous deed like taking your turn to bring food or flowers or incense to the temple. This is, this is lovely. There can also be a spur of the moment deed that happens. Suppose you're driving on a highway and there's an accident and you're the first one on the scene and people need help. No one else is around. Will you stop and do what needs to be immediately done as best as you can? When help arrives, you may go on your way. This opportunity can appear in front of you and you do it or not. It isn't planned. It is just pure giving at the time of need. Now in the 60s, this part, it got really messed up. <laughs> this little example here, because people would walk around and they'd see uh, somebody like uh, May in a car accident and uh, they would see there was nobody else around and they are in a hurry to get somewhere and they would just go by and one would say to the other, why didn't you stop? And the other would say, oh, well, that's just that person's karma. Hmm. Is this a clear understanding about karma? <laughs> no, it's not. And if they had stopped, then in the future, when they were in an accident, somebody very likely would stop for them. But if they just left her there and just kept driving and didn't stop in the future, something will happen to them in this life because they just made a big mistake. They did something in wrong kind of karma and it will come back. It will bite them on an even level. The same thing will come back on them. Most people, when they're like about over 35, 30, 35 years, they'll tell you that they know something that happened when they were younger and it came around to bite them later. And that's karmic kickback. That's what I call it. It's kicking back. Karmic kickback is coming around. It's the fruit of you producing bad karma in this life. It's a small one and it's going to go in a circle like this and come back and get you right in the face, it's gonna get you back. Perhaps you're riding a bike and you see somebody falling off the bike. Do you stop and help them get up? Do you help or ignore the situation? How would you wanna be treated in the same situation if it were you who fell? What did this event appear in, why did the event appear in front of you? Is it a karmic opportunity or is it a bothersome impediment during your daily routine in life? How you frame this event in your mind before, during, and after 
it happens is important because perhaps this is the universe giving you an opportunity to perform generosity through an actual physical deed and burn off some old karma where you didn't do that before in another life. What about merit? In Buddhism, there is a thing called merit. Building merit is good and it helps with the positioning of future rebirths. But this is, this is true, but people can get consumed in performing merit and forget what the real teaching is all about. And this can become an imbalance in your progress and development. And there's another teacher that is saying basically that, you know, to them, what they've seen in Buddhism, they're older than I am, they're in their 80s. And um, they're basically saying, you know, what they see now is so much is falling back to just saying it's, uh, it's the, the, um, the puja ceremony and precepts. And then it is um, this kind of thing where you don't, none of the real stuff about karma or about the actual teaching is taught anymore. So people come to meditation, they said to me, and basically to rest, to calm down, to feel lighter than they did during the week. And that's it. So the other illusion is delusion little piece is that Nibbana actually means Nibbana. And there's only one and that's it. <laughs> And I giggle about that because we know it's not true. We found suttas where the monk experienced for the first time Nibbana. Ah, he did it for the first time. So that's supportive of what we're teaching when we're saying to you that each level that's happening in the main four attainments and their fruitions, the arahat with fruition has experienced Nibbana eight times. So in Buddhism, this thing called merit can get out of control and people can find themselves consumed with performing merit and forget about what the real teaching is altogether. There is a story in the Dhammapada about a person who lights a candle, then walks through a village offering their flame so that people can light other candles. They had nothing else. And this is how pure merit is supposed to work. It's supposed to be passed to you and you're supposed to pass it to the next person and the next person. It's supposed to be a pay it forward system. If you ever saw that little movie it was a really great movie about merit and paying forward. Even stronger merit is when you share your merit after building it up inside yourself. So we're doing merit individually and we can do this so that all beings can benefit from the good that we do in our lives. Sharing merit is an act of selflessness, an act of giving up the craving or the act of generosity that we, we seek to hold on to. And after teaching the Dhamma, monastics are usually trained to share their merit, which they have acquired by giving this teaching to others for the benefit of happiness for all beings. And this is a selfless act. When we are Buddhist, should we ever accept gifts or just give them to others? That's a good question. That's a very good question. In balance, a person should remember that receiving a gift is important too. Helping others to build their merit is an act of generosity in itself. The person giving the gift to you is practicing generosity, and this should be supported and not turned down. If you do not need a gift that you are given, certainly after you own it, you can share it with someone later who will use it, but it should not be turned away. So when we turn away a gift, we take away the opportunity for someone else to make merit. So you need to collect, not to collect the gifts. But you should help the others receive benefit by giving them to you. Is there a proper way to give a gift 
and a way to receive it. This is fun. We went in the Dhamma to find, I can't remember the name of that sutta, um, but there's a set of instructions that's in the sutta, very, very clear. The first step is to prepare the gift with a happy mind and good intention. The second step is to see the person happy in your mind. The third is to give the gift with loving kindness. The fourth is to reflect on having given the gift afterwards with joy in your heart. These are the steps, the proper steps for giving a gift. You can go back a little bit before that and say, I make a decision to get May a gift, and then I go to seek the gift, and I'm happy. And even if I can't park the car in front of the store I want to go into, <laughs> I'm happy. I'm not frustrated. And I go and have a good day getting this, and then I enjoy wrapping it. I'm having fun wrapping it, and then I'm enjoying giving it to the gift when I give them the gift with loving kindness. So we were breaking it down to even more pieces. Then let the event go by gently into the past. And this is the proper way to give a gift. And what about receiving a gift? When receiving a gift, receive it graciously and with a smile of acceptance. Sending loving kindness and kind thoughts to the person giving the gift is a very good thing. Always keep a light mind and have fun creating happiness for other people. Then, can these acts of generosity involve all three parts of thought, word, and deed at once? And the answer is yeah, sure. Suppose you are in a food market line and there is a mother with a small child in the basket in front of you. The mother is struggling now to empty her basket for the cashier and not block the line too long a time. Her baby starts to fuss and maybe cry too while you are standing behind her basket. Is there a potential for generosity in the situation? Ah, you think, I bet I can make this little baby smile a bit and just calm down. You first compliment the mother about her little baby with kind words. Moms just love this. What a beautiful baby you have. She's so cute. Begin by sending loving kindness to the little child and smiling. And young children will pick up on this right away. So don't be surprised at the look you get from them because then you start to occupy the baby by making faces with it or playing peekaboo behind a piece of paper with it uh, or with your hand or a hat while smiling. And the baby starts to calm down right away and watch you. In this example, your generosity and radiance has changed the entire environment in the store. You have relieved the mother relaxed the cashier, calmed the people who were anxious around you, made the baby happier, and you may even ha be having fun too. <laughs> this is using all the parts of generosity in daily life coupled with sending out loving kindness. So thoughts, words, and deeds are happening here. And look how you affect the world around you. Do you see? The whole store is smiling now and nobody's being grumbly or gruff or anxious. There, we did it uh, as a test. We went to a store and did it on a Friday night when people were trying to get a bunch of stuff for the weekend. And it worked just exactly the way it's described. So don't be shy about this. This is a great practice to see how you can affect the world around you without much cost at all. It's a gift that we can give each other through life. How is this preparing you for the practice of meditation? That's a fair question. The entire meditation practice is about opening the heart, emptying out old suffering of the past from the mind. It's about letting go of old rubbish from the past a lot of suffering is stored inside us behind a little locked gate in your head. 
and we have locked in the sorrows of yesterday in our minds and in our heart sometimes holding on to the past as if it were today. So as we begin to practice generosity and our meditation, we're going to open this gate and let some of this out. And we need our heart to be operational and not locked up so tight. We need to be gentle with ourselves. We need to smile. If we practice first, a little bit, we can handle the outflow better because through these acts of generosity, we begin to feel again and are ready to go deeper and look inside for bigger answers. Clearing out the rubbish, so to speak, prepare is preparing us for the journey. We can then investigate the deeper potential of a clear, clean, pure mind. It's impossible to do more advanced investigation into uh, the deeper states without doing such preparatory work first. So the next topic we go into next time is Sheila.